If you've got children in Georgia schools, you may not have been pleased with the news this week that Georgia once again ranked very low in the nation when it comes to SAT scores. Kelly McCutcheon of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation, do the results of that test tell us that Georgia schools simply don't measure up, or does it hide some good news out there as well? Bill, it's very disappointing, obviously. Uh, Georgia is making great strides in education, but what we really need is a quantum leap forward, and uh, we're not really seeing that at all with these SAT scores. What's more disappointing is the SAT doesn't even measure uh, what the kids that have already dropped out of high, of high school are doing, and I think that's one of the biggest problems. State Representative Kathy Ash, education has always been one of your chief concerns. How worried are you about what this SAT test result shows? Of course I'm worried. I'd like it to be great, but it is progress. It continues to move in the right direction. We continue to have in place lots of innovations that are designed to help not only with SAT scores, but with assessment and bottom line achievement of children. Tom Upchurch, president of the Georgia Partnership for Excellence in Education. Are we doing the job of creating excellence in education when we see SAT scores like those released this week? Well, we have to do better. It's obvious that uh, the gap between the advantaged student and the disadvantaged student is widening, and that's, that's a problem. And we're going to talk about not only the problems, but some of the successes in Georgia's schools on this edition of Georgia Week in Review. I'm Bill Nygut. We're glad you're with us. Um, we have some pretty interesting uh, uh, information to convey on this show today. Kelly McCutcheon, the Georgia Public Policy Foundation, annually releases a report card of the best schools in the state of Georgia. We're going to hear some of that from you, Tom. We're going to uh, hear the results of a survey you've done on parents and uh, attitudes about education and what they want done about it in this state. Bef and before we get to any of that, let me talk about again, let's go back to this SAT question, and, and uh, Representative Ash, if you don't mind, I want to start with you. We have heard so much about how hard George is working to improve its schools. It's talked about in the legislature, the governor has done all this great work with pre-K and Hope Scholarship and all of this sort of thing, and yet we seem to still be having severe problems. How concerned are you about all of this? I am concerned. I'm also concerned about how difficult it is to deal with a product like a student's 12-year education. It's not that we start with a simple input and what an output. We have all sorts of variables that come into this equation, and it's very difficult to change things overnight. It takes time, and it takes sticking with a course of action for long enough to be able to measure what it is you're doing. When you say sticking with a course of action, what does that mean? Well, one of the things that happens in education is that we get all of these different waves of change. Years ago, we decided that maybe phonics wasn't working, so we didn't teach kids phonics in elementary school. Now we've come to the conclusion that that was a big mistake and we need to go back to phonics. To be able to measure exactly what does what and what produces which particular thing we want to have happen with a child's education. It's just hard. Tom Upchurch, um, as your organization has worked to uh, try to make the schools better, um, you, I'm sure, have wrestled with the problem uh, of whether or not really measuring achievement is the best way to find out about what students are doing. I mean, isn't that part of the problem, whether we think measurements like SAT tests and other testing are really a way to evaluate what's happening in the schools? Of course, there are no simplistic answers, but one of, one of the things that we know will help improve public schools is the sort of thing that the Georgia Public Policy Foundation is doing with its report card. So reporting information to the public is good. Does a shame list improve schools? If your school is listed in the newspaper as being underperforming, does that community then rally around that school and improve the school? In many cases, the answer to that is yes. We've just polled the public in Georgia on the issue of standards and accountability. What 
do the people in the state think about this? And we've seen examples of, of strong accountability laws in North Carolina, Maryland, Texas, that seems to be improving education in those states. Well, as long as you've brought up your survey, why don't you go ahead and talk with us about some of the most important results you, your survey discovered in terms of, of attitudes of the public out there toward education. Of course, we, we do two polls per year. We contract with the Applied Research Center at Georgia State University to do that. And again, we always ask that question, what is the most important issue facing Georgians? And again, education is at the top of that list. It's, it comes in uh, in front of doing something about drugs and crime and social issues and budget and taxes. Education is far above that on the minds of Georgians. But the issue that we were really asking was, do you believe that rewards and sanctions for schools, rewards for schools that are doing well, sanctions for schools that are doing poorly, uh, would improve schools in the state. And uh, more Georgians believe rewards uh, improve education than they do sanctions. In fact, we have a long way to go if we talk to Georgians about state takeover, for example, of poor performing schools. Rewards. What kind of rewards do we, do you, do you, how do you, you both jump in on well, this as I th well? Well, I think that Tom has a good point, and people do like to see incentives. We don't have very many incentives in public education now. Uh, take, for instance, the teacher pay raises. Governor Miller has implemented four years of 6% pay raises each year, which I think is great. I think teachers need to be paid more. But the problem is a the best math teacher in the state and a teacher that, say, is not a very good teacher and ha doesn't work very hard got the same raise. There's no differentiation based on merit, and I think it's one way to reward our best teachers. Boy, you know, I was down in uh, South Georgia with Guy Milner last spring on a campaign trip with him, covering his campaign, and we went into a uh, middle school, I think, maybe it was an elementary school, um, and he began talking about, about teacher incentive pay. You know, you're good, your class performs well, you, you get paid a bonus or whatever. And it was clear that he thought he was really going to hit a home run with that idea, talking to all of these teachers, and they just laid into him and made it clear that that's a tricky area. Their argument being, of course, you can't punish a teacher if she happens to get a group of kids who are under performers. It's a very controversial issue, yes? Very controversial, very important. We have to move to it. We have to move to some sorts of ways <clears throat> of saying to good schools, you're doing a good job, to good teachers, this is a real profession and you need to be there. Tying these two things together, one of the most disturbing pieces of SAT knowledge is that the people who scored the lowest on the SATs are the folks who are thinking about being teachers. And that's a very disturbing long-term piece of information. Georgia may have to do things like Massachusetts and California have done with teacher testing to be sure that we have basic competency skills in reading, writing, and math. And then we may have to find some ways to say to good teachers, thank you for a good job. This is, this is one of the major issues that we have. How do we attract the very brightest people into the teaching profession and retain those teachers once we have them? What are some answers? I mean, we know it's a problem, but I mean, the, the, You've raised the pay of teachers over the last eight years, have you not, in the legislature? We have. You now have got, you're fairly, com we're pretty competitive in terms of pay, aren't we, in, in, with other states? And fairly, in the com Southeast. fairly competitive, Bill, with, with uh, teachers. But when you think about someone with a chemistry major teaching chemistry in a rural school in Georgia, beginning salary $23,000 per year, when that person with a chemistry major will directly out of college, possibly uh, be making 40000 in another profession. And this is, this is, uh, this is a problem area. Uh, an anecdote, today we're attempting to hire a secretary in my office, and, and it's very difficult to hire a good secretary for a beginning teacher's salary. All right, so what do we do about it? Give me some answers. Well, first thing, with, with going back to the merit pay, question. I think Kathy has a very good idea. One problem, it, it is very complicated to figure out how do we determine who the best teachers are. One problem we have in Georgia is we don't test our students every year. 
So we have no idea if you had a bright group of students that came in and you did a very good job at moving them up to the next level, or you had a, a low performing group of kids that you pretty much kept in that category. If we tested our kids every year, then we could evaluate teachers much more objectively. Mm -hmm. Until we do that, we can't. What else do we do about teachers? We give teachers more autonomy in classrooms. We let them be more involved in making decisions about what goes on in their classroom. We treat them like professionals. I, I, by the way, I have not forgotten about your scorecard, your, your report card. We're going to save that for a few more minutes because I know there are parents out there who really want to hear it. But we're just going to tease folks a little bit longer with that, if you don't mind, Kelly. So let me, let me before we go to that, talk about something else that, that you talked about, Tom, that I thought was important. You said that, that um, things like the report card are very important because it tells people in communities where they stand and it gives them incentive to get involved. It seems to me that parental involvement has been a key problem in the Georgia schools. The schools that do better are the schools where parents are really involved. What do we do to try to make it easier There's, uh, to, for parents to get involved with the schools? Anybody? Well, parents must feel welcome in schools. And, and this, is, this is one of those things that uh, many, of, many of the children that are doing poorly, maybe their parents did poorly before them, and they're uncomfortable at school. So as school administrators and school teachers, we must open our doors to parents and make them feel welcome when they come and let them understand that this is a team effort to improve opportunities for their child. All parents, or most parents, want to be good parents if they know how to do that. Well, Kathy Ash, this gives me the chance. I was looking for a segue to ask you about one of your favorite subjects, charter schools, which encourage parental involvement and, and which give, give the schools some opportunities to be a little bit more creative and experimental. Why don't you tell us about, first of all, make sure our viewers know exactly what a charter school is. A charter school is a school that exchanges flexibility from rules and regulations for accountability for results. Now in Georgia, a charter school can be an existing public school, one started by a private organization, a private individual, or by a state or local public entity that applies to the state and local school boards for permission to operate under a charter, a contract, saying what it is they're going to do which of the rules and regs they're going to follow, which they need to be exempt from to do the things they think they need to do for the kids in that school. How many charter schools do we have in the state right now? We now have 27, and there are several more in the drawing boards. This week there was a proposal given to the Savannah School Board for one of those what I like to call from scratch charter schools, not a conversion from a current public school. What, what, what's an example of the sort of thing that a charter school might do differently from the way the schools that are operating within the standard system operate? A charter school might have a particular focus on a topic, a particular focus on a challenge that schools are facing. Several of the really fine charter schools across the country deal with the dropout problem that you talked about, Kelly. They try to find creative, different solutions. It sort of relates back to my first comment about the complexity of education. We don't have a way in teaching and learning to measure results over a short period of time. It takes a long time to see the finished product. Charter schools are what I like to call incubators of change. And they are also very controversial. Well, I think the charter schools are probably one of the most exciting things that have happened to Georgia in a long time in terms of education. Governor Miller uh, got a charter school law passed, one of the first in the country back in 1993. What Kathy's bill that was passed uh, this year did was allow these new from scratch charter schools, which means that parents who before now have never had a choice, they couldn't afford a private school, they've never had a choice of pr public schools, they now have a choice. And when parents have a choice, they become involved. And I think every educator will tell you one of the key factors in educational performance is parental involvement. The criticism of charter schools, of course, across the country has been that, that the record shows that they have not attracted the underachievers in many cases, that, that we're really trying the hardest to, to, to somehow help, um, that, that because of the, the, the need for parents to get involved and acti actively pursue this concept, 
you're not helping those kids who are in households where the parents aren't involved, where there's just no motivation. And in that sense, the charter school simply helps the kids who are already doing well. Actually, that's what people like to say about charter schools. The reality of what we know about where the charter schools are across the country, they are in areas where we have challenges, where we need to find ways. The operations that are being considered for Georgia from scratch schools are in places where traditional public education has not been successful. Tom Upchurch, your survey talks about accountability and how much people in this state want it. Does, do, do, does your organization believe that charter schools are one way to achieve that kind of accountability? We've encouraged charter schools. In fact, uh, we've worked with Representative Ash on this issue. And even the, the conversion schools, the public schools, the traditional public school has become a charter. The reason we encourage that is because they're trying something different in many cases. They may be reorganizing the way they uh, use time, possibly the school calendar, the school day, the numbers of children in classrooms. And, and those decisions are made with great parental involvement. We have one charter school system in Georgia, the Cartersville City Schools. All those schools are charters and operate with a governing board at each one of the schools. And what do we know about how they're doing up there? Well, the Cartersville is one of our best school districts in the state of Georgia with a very diverse population. It, there's something, there's an irony here, it seems to me. Um, on one hand, there seems to be a sense that part of the problem with the education system in the state is that there's not enough state control, that, that everything is too decentralized, that perhaps some people would encourage a stronger state involvement in local school systems. Charter schools seem to go just the opposite way. Leave me alone, state. We want to work this out within the community. Is there a room for both oh. of those somehow to take, take oh, effect? Oh, we, we feel, you go ahead. I can't resist. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Because what we're saying is that if you can measure what it is you're doing, if you say going in, this is what we're going to accomplish, be it a better school attendance record, be it a better school dropout record, be it clearly better student achievement, then we'll give you the freedom to do these things. That really is the carrot. I think in Georgia we're going to have to come to a stick as well. But clearly local control, folks making decisions about their children is the key to improving education. Do you want to jump in on that, Kelly? Well, I, I think uh, Representative Ash is entirely right. I think we need to encourage local control. The state's role is to set high standards, to have accountability, to test the students and report those results to the public so they can make judgments as to whether the schools are succeeding. They do, the state does not need to micromanage how the schools are run. We don't need to te tell teachers how to teach or principals how to manage their schools unless they're not performing. In that situation, we need to make sure we do everything we can to encourage other choices for those parents. Let me, um, let me give you a chance now to talk a little about your report card. You do this every year. You try to rank the top high schools, middle schools, and grade schools across the state. And you do that on what basis? Well, as Tom said earlier, uh, parents care most about academic performance. Every survey you see, that's the, their main concern. What we want to do, there are mountains of statistical information out there on public schools, but they're almost indecipherable for parents and, and laymen. What we want to do is take those factors that are most important to parents and put them in a simple, understandable uh, format for them to look at and then rank the schools, you know, have some accountability. And, you know, let's celebrate the schools that are succeeding in Georgia. So Give us some results. You've got, give us the top couple of schools in each of the categories. Let's start with elementary schools. Uh, elementary schools, Kittredge uh, Magnet School and Vanderland in DeKalb County, and Sarah Smith in the City of Atlanta Public Schools are the number one schools in the state. Uh, and middle schools, Dickerson and Mabry in Cobb County, and Haynes Bridge uh, Middle School in Fulton County. And high schools, Walton in, in Cobb County, Lakeside in Columbia County, and Davidson Magnet School in Richmond County. And as you hear these schools being named, what do they have in common? What, what themes run through schools like this? Well, what we've seen, and, and you mentioned socioeconomic status, it's true. There is a negative relationship between test scores and poverty. The higher the poverty, the lower your test scores. 
But that doesn't hold true for all the schools. And what we found when we do these reports, we try to find those schools that might have high poverty, have high test scores, find out what they are doing. And the one thing that runs across all the schools that are so-called beating the curve is that they expect every child to learn. They have very high expectations of all their children. Talk about that. What does that yes. mean? That means they have a standard, that there's a standard for students, uh, academic standards, probably behavioral standards as well. And then there, uh, we believe that there ought to be state standards for schools and state standards for school systems. What is a standard? Well, tell me what, the, what kind of standard would you have for the schools? What are some standards? that we don't well, employ Well, already. certainly uh, standards for students that we all understand would be the graduation test that was discussed at great length this past spring. That test has been in place since 1991. But this year was the first year science and social studies was a part of the test. And we had a number of students that didn't measure up. They didn't get a high school diploma in the state of Georgia. I have an idea that next year that number of students that fail to meet that standard will be considerably less than it was this year. So that's, that's what we mean by standard. This is, this is what you must do to graduate from high school, and if you do not meet that, you will not get a diploma. What you're talking about is the same sort of thing that, that uh, the uh, child development people tell parents. In your household, set a standard for your children. Here's what I expect from you, and if you don't live up to this expectation, here is what the consequences of that are. You're saying the schools need to employ similar tactics. Absolutely. Consequences matter. Um, so what else? What are some other themes that run through all of this that you can help us identify that, that, that we can really grab hold of and take back to our own schools? One is leadership. I think in every one of these successful schools, I think you're going to find a principal who is a, a good leader. And the second is focus. Most all of these schools, the focus is on learning and results. And so they put a very much credence in test results. And, you know, they're in schools sometimes, especially, you know, you have the political correctness that pervades the schools. We, you know, we have all these feel-good uh, ideas that we want to encourage. The schools that are successful, they say, we're here to teach you reading, math, social studies, and all these subjects, and that's our primary focus. We're starting to run short on time, so let me throw out a couple of other questions for you and, and try to move through the last few things here. Um, number one, in the governor's race this year, we're hearing a lot about discipline in the schools, about weeding out behavioral problems. Uh, Roy Barnes has a proposal that would create uh, a stronger emphasis on alternative schools for kids who are disruptive in the classroom, that sort of thing. How important is that sort of idea? Are the schools being disrupted by kids who have behavioral problems of one sort or another? Is it, is it a significant problem? It is a problem. I, there is a study done recently, I think last year, that surveyed teachers in Georgia and on their concern about guns and violence in schools. And our concern, uh, our teachers' concern was higher than that of all but five other states. So I think we do have a problem. We've just done a series of focus groups with teachers around the state. And of course, that was the number one issue there was this, this issue of behavior and and violence and discipline in schools. So do we need to put uh, those students in, in alternative schools, get them out of the classroom? Well, uh, the issue that the teachers tell us that if they have 25 children in the classroom and they have to spend all their time with one or two children that are, that are acting inappropriately in that classroom, that it's taken away from the other children. Parents believe that. I believe that. And uh, as a result, we've seen a movement toward alternative schools and I think that must be expanded. It's sort of like one size shoe doesn't fit every foot. One kind of school doesn't work for every kid. And for that kid who is disruptive in a classroom, we need to find an alternative that works. The Republican gubernatorial candidate, your candidate, Guy Milner, uh, talks about class size, which we all worry about, I suppose, in the public school system particularly. Um, is there a way to reduce class size, increase the number of teachers in the schools without busting the budget in this state? Is that another thing that we really need to be looking at? We have to decide how important quality education is. And if it is, we have to look to all of the ways in which we can improve it. And lowering class size is clearly one of the variables that makes a difference. Do the two of you see that, that is realistic given our, given our budget in this state? We know that, that some 
groups of children um, are, are some classes may be larger than others, disadvantaged children are harder to teach. Some of those classes need to be considerably smaller maybe than a class in a more advantaged community. Now that sounds unfair, particularly if you're a parent in a, a child in an advantaged community. But reality is that uh, in most cases it takes more resources for that disadvantaged child than it does the child that has a lot of support from home. Okay, so let's wrap this up. I mean, we've said we need more accountability. Um, your survey says more accountability. Parents right. want teachers held accountable, principals held accountable, schools held accountable for how they're dealing with their, their children. Um, you talk about how important it is that there be standards and set primarily by testing as often as right. possible. Focus, a focus on results. Despite how controversial some testing is. Well, you need to have, make sure you have a good test, and that's the problem with Georgia. <laughs> with test. So Kathy, as you want to see us keep working on charter schools, which will be incubators for great ideas. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you all for joining us. This is a discussion that will continue for quite a while. By the way, last week we did a program on Atlanta theaters, and I got a lot of calls from people saying, how could you not have mentioned Actors Express, one of the real venerable institutions in this town? And I should have mentioned them because they're one of my favorite theaters. So tonight we do. Go see their programs. Theater in the Square up in Marietta made a call and said, you should talk about us. We're doing a lot of good work in Cobb County. We got you both in. Thanks for joining us this week on Georgia Week in Review.